Now, Sports Talk with Broads. Here's Hunter Brody. What is going on, everyone? Welcome to Sports Talk with Broads. We are broadcasting live from the Manscaped Man Cave. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code BROD at manscaped.com. Look, the Phillies frustrating season is finally over. I'm not over it. I'm still fired up about it, and that's why we will have Ricky Botalico joining us in a couple of minutes via phone call. Yes, that is true. We have Ricky Bo joining us. I can't wait to get his thoughts on, you know, this team, the way it ended, the bullpen, Aaron Nola, Joe Girardi, Bryce Harper, you name it. It is annoying that we are now hearing different reports about what's going on. You know, we heard a couple weeks ago, hey, if the Phillies don't make the postseason, Matt Klintak is going to be fired. Now we're hearing that people inside who cover the Phillies are hearing from their sources that there's a chance Matt Klintak does not get fired. I don't know how you look at what has happened over the last five seasons and go, this guy's doing a good job. This guy has our system going well when it comes to prospects. This guy did a great job with the bullpen, who was the second worst bullpen since 1912 with a 7-plus ERA. I don't know how you look at what he has provided for this club and you go, you know what, I want to continue to keep this man inside this organization. He's pathetic. Him and Andy McPhail are a joke. John Middleton is starting to look like a serious fraud if he continues to go down this road. He needs to make change. And if you tell me that the reason he doesn't make change is because of the contract and what's left on Matt Klintak's deal, that's a problem. You are a multi, multi, multi millionaire and you're going to allow six million million dollars to be the difference in actually making a proper move and putting this organization in the right spot. You talk about how you want that damn trophy back. Well, if six million dollars, if I told John Middleton that six million dollars you got to throw away and that will help you get that damn trophy back, you better, you better do that. It's that simple. You better do that. I don't think it's much questions asked. Six mil to him? Come on. And it's the same issue we're having with the luxury tax. Although, if you actually had a GM who knew what he was doing, with the amount of money you allow him to spend, you probably would be in a different situation where the luxury tax, maybe you would have to touch it, but there would be a difference. Your team would be built better, and you'd be closer to competing. I don't think John Middleton has a problem doing it if he knows the team is ready to compete, but doesn't that show John Middleton the issue? You gave him this much money to spend, and you're not ready to actually compete. You're actually making historic failures in this league. You're being on lists that you don't even want to be on. So how does that not go through his head? And I just feel he wants to support his own logic. How many times have we heard him speak about Matt Klintak, how much of a genius he is, Dartmouth, this and that? He doesn't know a damn thing, and it's okay to admit I made a mistake. We haven't heard a peep from this organization since everything happened. Since they missed the playoffs in a season where bad teams make the playoffs. It's incredible to me. How have we not heard a peep? Matt Klintak, Andy McVale, they should have been fired days ago after an Eagles big-time tie. I was going to say a big-time loss. That's what it felt like, but it was a tie. Monday, overreaction to the Eagles. Just slip in a little note. To the fan base, just slip in a little press release on Twitter. And boom, people aren't even talking about it anymore because they're all focused on the Eagles. But the more you let this linger, the more you let this kind of get milked out, I don't know what they're waiting for. There shouldn't even be a question. There needs to be serious moves made from an organizational standpoint. Like the philosophy as a whole from single A all the way up, from rookie ball all the way up. There's a problem with this organization. They just don't do a good job at all at actually providing great prospects and great players. The best time they did it, yeah, you had the championship. But when have they really brought together pieces up like that? In their whole entire existence. Utley, Rollins, Howard, Hamels, awesome. Sign me up. But they haven't been close to sniffing anything like that. All right, let's get to let's get to Ricky Bell. 
Real quick before we do, though, make sure you go check out BetQL.com. If you're big in sports betting, even if you're not big in sports betting and you want to be, go to BetQL.com, use code BROADS20 at checkout for your 20% off of your first payment. They have all the data, all the trends, all the analytics that you need to help you make an educated decision when betting. So when football comes around, I'm looking at all the sharp money where all the professional bettors are headed, and I'm just copying them. And it's a genius idea. You really need to utilize BetQL. They have a mobile app as well as BetQL.com. All the information is down below. All right, let's throw it to Ricky Bow. And now we are joined by Ricky Botalico of NBC Sports Philadelphia. Ricky, thank you so much for joining. My pleasure. Anytime. Thank you so much. So, yeah, let's just get right into this. I mean, there's so much to get into. There's so many different avenues that we can go down. I I guess we'll start here, though. That last series, you look at the Tampa Bay Rays, great baseball team, no doubt about it. But, you know, you got to win. You need to win. And the Vinny V game, it was what it was. But with an opportunity with Zach Wheeler and Aaron Nola on the bump to come up short and not win any, it's just so frustrating. It's extremely frustrating. I mean, you know what really got me that last game? It looked like they had already packed it in. But, and, and that, to me, is unacceptable. You, you, go to, you go to the ballpark to win every day. You're, you're major league ball players. That's what you're supposed to do is go to the ballpark to win every day. And it looked like they just packed it in. I mean, they, well, they had one win in, in uh, Nola and Wheeler's last eight starts. Wow. I, I mean, this is a ball club. If you remember at the beginning of the year, I don't want I, I, I don't want to throw this out there just for no reason. But if you remember, was upset because prognosticators picked them in a bad position. Well, guess what? They were right, and Reese was wrong in that in that sense. But I I, I just you know I, I thought there was more to this ball club than what actually showed up, especially the last weekend of the season. I would absolutely agree with you. And um, look, Aaron Nola couldn't even get out of the fourth inning. And obviously when Aaron Nola is on, it's magnificent. He gets a lot of strikeouts. I mean, it's beautiful. It's artwork what he does when he's at the top of his game. But the last couple Septembers haven't been good. His ERA over his last couple games was over six. I I wanted. I I knew this team didn't have it all. Like they weren't really a postseason team. The only reason they were involved is because of the COVID stuff and the expanded – you know, the extended playoffs. But with Aaron Nola, I just wanted to see him go out there in the big moment. If he if he diced them up and went eight strong and only allowed one earned run and they lost one nothing, I can leave that game feeling satisfied about Nola. But that just wasn't the case. Yeah, I, I don't know what it is about Nola late in the season. I mean, I could see in his pitches what's going on. I mean, number one, his location was gone, as everybody saw. Um, he, he walked, what, three more in that game? He walked five three starts ago, so that's not Aaron Nola to start with, and his curveball didn't have bite on it, so I mean, you take those two things away from Aaron Nola, he becomes a very ordinary pitcher, I don't know why that has happened, I looked at his mechanics, I didn't think it was quite that, I felt like it had more to do with the snap on the baseball, um, and a lot of people, well, maybe he's a little tired, it, that's, that's equivalent to being in June. I mean, for starting pitchers, you're still getting the four days off and then going in your fifth day. You, you expected no, more out of Aaron Nola, there's no doubt, in his last three starts. Now, what about Zach Wheeler in his last start? Because he did go deep. He threw a ton of pitches, but he allowed four earned runs and walked four. I mean, I, at some point, I feel I'm being extra harsh on Nola and Wheeler. But at the same time, you know, look, this was equivalent to a huge start for this team. And he did go deep, though, so I feel torn on, you know, how I should feel about Zach Wheeler's last outing. I think the one thing that has to be taken into consideration, and take this how you may, is that when you go out there and you think you're going to, you know, give up a run or two and you're going to lose because of it, I think I think Wheeler and Nola may have felt like I have to do this all myself and maybe we'll scrape together a run against the Rays. I believe it was more of a mindset for those guys. Obviously, they're going out there doing the exact same thing they've been doing, but it didn't work for either one of them. 
I, I, you have to look at this in a different sense that maybe their minds were taking everything over more than anything else. I and think it, they were they were trying to do too much. Yeah, and it's very possible that it, that that is the case when you have the bullpen that you have, which we'll get into. But before we do, though, I just want to touch on a couple other starting pitchers. Zach Eflin this year, uh, tremendous when it comes to the strikeouts. That sinker pitch, and then he's added other elements to his game as well. And the one thing I love about him, which is the complete opposite of what we saw out of Vince Velasquez, is the ability to go deep. The, he, he keeps the pitch count so low to be able to go nine, to be able to go so deep in, in today's game. It's just not normal. So Zach Eflin, he's intriguing me for what's to come. By the way, I think that's gonna flip flop again. I think the starting I think people are starting to notice that the starting pitchers are a lot more important than people would have thought. I think that's gonna flip flop here, uh, in the next couple of years. That they're gonna want their starters to go deeper. We saw it with Joe Girardi this year. The bullpens all around the league, I mean granted the Phillies was epically bad, but bullpens all around the league have not have been shaky at best, but with Eflin, he's always um, shown that ability to go deep into games because he's looking for contact. There's not a lot of uh, starting pitchers out there that want contact early on in the count. That's, I mean, if you want to contrast him and Velasquez, you already know the answer. Vince is Vince doesn't want contact. He wants strikeouts, and Eflin will get his strikeouts, but he wants contact. So I I just think Eflin has made a statement, and I think he made the statement even later because he pitched better when it meant to be – when you needed him to be better. So, I mean, to me, that's making a statement. Everybody knows he's got the stuff. Well, he, he proved it late in the season. He absolutely did, and it was, uh, it was tremendous to watch. Now, Spencer Howard, he blows 97, 98. It's electric, but it does seem like he's getting tired. And I actually heard you on the post game once when he was talking about how long it took him to warm up his shoulder, and you said you went through something similar. That's not a great sign. By no means am I ruling him out. It's way too early in his career. But, um, but I, I did think that, you know, fatigue set into a factor early in the games and his pitch count went extremely high. Very young and a lot to work with in, in terms of, you know, making that jump to the major league level. But I want to get your thoughts on what you saw out of Spencer Howard. Well, I think when you come up to the big leagues, you either come up with a vengeance or you come up with thoughts in your mind that, that you're not good enough or you don't belong there. I think he was one of those guys who may have had some of those thoughts where, you know, what do I need to do? And then he got hit around in his first game. Do I have to change my approach? You don't change your approach that early. You keep going after hitters. You're not going to switch from a power pitching starter to a finesse pitcher in four or five starts. It doesn't work that way. This is, this is a guy who's just got to go out there and trust his, his own stuff. And, yes, the shoulder issues are concerning because whenever it takes you longer to warm up, that's when you know you have some kind of an issue. Obviously, they were able to rehab this one. He was on the roster there late in the season. So I, I just, you know what, to me, he's got a good fastball, good curveball, has to work a little bit on his changeup and, and you know, that, that cutter slash slider. I, but location is number one. I think they taught these kids in the minor leagues to pound up in the zone, up in the zone, up in the zone. The league's going to catch up to that. And we're we're starting to see it with with everybody. I love if that you, you brought ever that think up. about yeah. this. Uh, yeah, go ahead. If you ever think about this, there are trends in baseball, and I can go far, go as far back as Trevor Hoffman. How big was the changeup back then? It was a huge pitch. Everybody started to use it because it worked for Trevor Hoffman. It worked for Greg Maddox, the two seam fastball with Maddox, and then everybody jumped on that bandwagon. I mean, go go as far back as the 70s or whatever, 80s with Suter, with his split finger. Everybody wanted to try the split finger. Well, this is no different right now. That they, that You went to the high fastball, the hitters weren't ready for it, and then all of a sudden, you know, now you notice that a lot of mistakes could also be made up there because you're talking a matter of an inch uh, that the hitter hits the ball going up top of the fastball. 
Yeah, and, and last year, uh, that was a big conversation of going high in the strike zone. And Zach Eflin, sp specifically, Zach Eflin was one of the ones that kind of fought back and went back to his older ways. And then you saw a better version of Zach Eflin towards the end of last season as well. So I know that that's something from a whole well, philosophy standpoint that doesn't seem to be the right move. Let me throw this at you. If you're a sinker ball pitcher, okay, if, if you were Roy Halladay, are you going to go to a four-seam fastball up in the zone? The answer is probably no. So, I mean, you, you can't change the stripes, and I think the Phillies tried to do that last year, and it hurt a couple guys for sure. No doubt. Now, the bullpen. It's hard to escape that. We probably should have let off with it because of how disgraceful it was. The seven-plus ERA, most historic since 1912. You know, we've been through the, the blown saves of Workman or Neris or whoever it was. It honestly felt like it didn't even matter who it was. They were going to fail regardless. Even if someone came in with the one ERA, they were going to fail with that Phillies uniform on. So, you know, I just want to get your thoughts on how, how do you fix this? I thought Connor Brogdon showed magnificent stuff late. You also saw some things out of JoJo. Romero, but how the hell do you fix this type of bullpen? Oh, man. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Um, you, you know what? I think you, number one, have to clean the house as quickly as you can. And then you really have to assess what what is your main need. You need a closer, right? You need somebody who's going to go in there and is it is eighty percent reliable in the closer's role. I always I, I don't know if you heard me talk about this, but I'm a, I look in an, as a bullpen guy as eighty percent. If you can give me four out of five, you belong in the bullpen. And I'm talking about games. You're going to have bad games every once in a while. Eighty percent is a bullpen guy and above. So you look for guys that can be those eighty percentiles. And the one thing that you don't have and did not have in this bullpen a lot of and I'll take J.C. Romero out of it, and I will put Brogdon also uh, out of it because I think he came back after he had that bad outing, he came back with a different mentality. The bullpen is also a mentality. Yes, you need to have some kind of stuff to pitch in late innings, but if you don't have that mentality to put people away late and want the baseball in the eighth and ninth inning, you don't belong in the bullpen. And that's, that's the one thing I would look for. I would look for hardened guys, hardened mindset guys, that if it happens to me one day, it's not happening the next. And you can find those guys. You just need somebody that's looking in the right direction. And I love that you went down that road because, you know, there's been some reports over the last couple of weeks of, hey, if the Phillies don't make the playoffs, you might see some moves with Matt Klintak. And then there was a report yesterday going out around, you know, maybe they're hearing words that he might stay here. Uh, you just have to think with the Matt Klintak era. He's been here for so long. You look at the system when it comes to prospects. Yes, Alec Bohm looks awesome, but there's not really enough there for my liking, at least, and I would expect uh, others to feel the same way. The bullpen was horrendous. Looking at this roster, the five years of Matt Klintak era, it's, it just wasn't enough. So, to me, I mean, there just has to be change. You, you need the right people looking for the right direction as well. Like you just said, you would have to think – missing the playoffs in this scenario with an expanded playoff format that you can't accept this. No, it's, a, it's I, I got to believe it's a little embarrassing. I, I mean, if you're within the organization, it has to be a little bit embarrassing. Um, I mean, because when you look, you know, the, the, the Washington Nationals looked like they were on their, you know what, they were on like hiatus. I, let's face it, they were on a, they were on a vacation this year. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And then you look at teams like the Pirates were terrible. Arizona was bad. You, and then you are, by the way, because you didn't make the playoffs, you're looped right into those teams. I mean, there has to be some kind – somebody has to take responsibility for this, and nobody has. I think that's, that's the thing that, that bothers a lot of fans around here. They're like, wait a minute. They just did not make the playoffs when only, f what, five, six, seven teams don't make it. And wait a minute, we're looped into those bottom seven, the, the bottom seven teams. I mean, there has to be somebody out there to take responsibility. I think we're all still waiting for, for John Middleton to come out and, you know, give us a little something. How about a state of the Phillies? Um and it's just not happening right now. I'm sure you're upset. I'm, I'm sure you're sitting there going, 
you know what? Is somebody going to take this responsibility? Who, who is going to take the shot for this? And nobody has. Nobody wants to. And how much of this do you think has to do with the contract and how much is left on Matt Klintak's deal after the extension and with COVID-19 being in play? Do you think that the money, like that much money for John Middleton would be the difference on moving on from a general manager? Uh, it very well could be. I, I don't know what else you, you are looking for from Matt Klintak. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. What, what, what's he going to do for you that's not spending more of John Middleton's money? Because, and it, it, think about it, if you're the owner, it's like, wait a minute. Everything this guy is doing is taking money and putting it somewhere else. And I don't know if, if I was an owner how big that would go through for me. I, I, I just... He, he he doesn't have – we obviously know he doesn't have a minor league system because kind of used them all this year. And, you know, what you see is what you get. I don't consider Alec Bohm a minor leaguer anymore. He is a bona fide major leaguer. So, uh, you know, you, you spent that money on, on Scott Kingery, who has done zero in, in the years he's been here. And, I, you know – I know Hoskins was hurt this year. I think he was breaking out of it. I think he's a keeper still. But, but man, oh, man, you have nobody to come up and, and fill in spots, and I think that's a huge problem. Oh, it's a huge problem, absolutely. Yeah, this system is just, it's not good enough. Everything, you look around everything, and it's not good enough. You can look at the, the lineup and go, okay, well, it's definitely a deep lineup, but there's so many other holes that it, it doesn't make up for it. Now, I have a couple more for you before I let you go. Joe Girardi. John Middleton even stated, like, hey, getting Joe Girardi, that's as good as getting a, you know, a, a big star in this league. And I would say that I was a little underwhelmed with Joe. Not that he had a lot to work with. I think we all understand that. But there were still some moves that left me scratching my head. I just want to get your overall thoughts on what Joe Girardi was this season. Uh, I think you're right in the fact that he didn't have a lot of uh, cards in the deck. I, I think... You know, when, when when you're putting in Mickey Moniak in in your lineup at this point in his career, I don't I don't think you have many choices. And I, I have a hard time blaming Joe for this because he put the players on the field. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like he was playing for them. Yes, there were a couple moves here and there that you kind of scratch your head about, but I, I don't think there was more than a handful. So, you know, how much could he have done? It is a hard time to grade any manager in the big leagues. And and I'm not going to sit back and try to tell you that it's everything was okay because it wasn't. But to really grade managers this year, I think this was more of a year to grade your general manager considering um, how everything panned out and when you look at it, what kind of personnel you actually had. So I'm having a hard time. You know, even even giving Girardi any kind of a grade for this year. I can support that. I definitely can. And with a good roster, I trust Joe Girardi to make the right decisions, you know, compare, majority of the time compared to maybe a Gabe Kapler or anybody else. So I, I definitely support that logic. Uh, Bryce Harper, he went through a tough slump at one point and the whole back thing happened. Did you see anything that showed you like, hey, that back injury was a significant problem to maybe that slump that he went through? Yeah, I think I, his swing was different. If you noticed, I mean, pulling off the baseball is one thing, but he was, like, literally trying to – I think he was trying to mask something uh, within his swing because even when he f kind of figured out where – if you watched his last three games, if you watched his swing, it was very upright and very general. There was no torque in it. He was just kind of swinging. I, I, I know it sounds – weird but he he just was not uh his normal self i mean i i just think it was obvious in his swing it was a completely different swing that that we we had seen all season long and then he comes in and he's just kind of hitting the ball the other way which normally is not bryce harper as we know he wants to pull 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 i think he'd be a better hitter if he if he just thought about hitting the ball the other way but um I, 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 just, I just think he was definitely masking something. His swing just looked different. Everything looked different, especially his upper side. I will leave you with this. JT Real Muto, 
Didi Gregorius, two players I think that the Phillies need to take a good look at bringing back. I like bringing Didi back and, and maybe keeping him here until Stott is ready. I don't know how long that's going to be, but it's just a scenario that I like to think about. With those two, if you could give me a percentage of how confident you feel them returning in a Phillies uniform, what percentage would that be? Well, I think one kind of plays to the other. Uh, if you don't get JT, I think you definitely have to bring back DD. Um, if you get JT, I don't think the numbers are going to be there to bring in uh, DD. So, and, and quite frankly, I, I think JT is going to explore uh, free agency. And I can't blame him. I don't think anybody should blame him. And the last I heard on that was that they weren't even close. So you you talk about stupid money. I think it's going to be very stupid money if that, if that's the case. Yeah, that's, that's the unfortunate part. I would say, I would say as days go by, uh, JT gets slimmer and slimmer. And probably in the division too, from a lot of the reports that we're hearing with some teams interested. So uh, that'll be interesting. That'll be interesting. And Bryce Harper clearly won't be happy as he's putting up his Instagram posts and and making his comments about him needing to be here for him being, you know, the best catcher and and the best guy in his position. So it'll be interesting to see how this whole entire offseason plays out. It does seem like now it's been long enough where the Phillies, they slide under the radar because the Eagles start during the time of their collapse. But now it, it seems like the intensity has picked up with the front office and the ownership, which is what we need. So, thank you so much. It'll be interesting. Yeah, no doubt. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really, really appreciate your time. You got it. Anytime. I just want to thank Ricky Bo so much for joining me. That was so much fun. Without a doubt, talking to Ricky Bo about baseball. Come on, there's nothing better than that. Remember that this episode of Sports Talk with Broads is sponsored by Orbit Energy and Power, and with over 20 years of experience in the industry, they are home to your solar experts in both residential and commercial projects. Their information is down below. I want to touch on, you know, one thing that Ricky Bo said that really stood out to me is Reese Hoskins, not ready to give up on him. You know, like, obviously he said a lot of things, right, but... One thing that I wish I could have followed up with that's eaten me a bit is the whole Reese Hoskins thing. And, you know, he thinks he could be this player and he's not willing to give up on him. Looking at that first base position, Alec Bohm looks so much better at first base than he does at third base. And I feel that's more of his natural spot over at first. Now you have a DH in play. Can Reese Hoskins just be your DH? And when Alec Bohm is the DH, maybe Reese plays first base. I guess you can you can go down that road. I was going to mention, well, hey, first base can be packed. If JT Real Muto is here, he could play first base as well at times, specifically maybe later on in his career. There's just a jam at first. But realistically, I don't see a scenario right now where they sign him because they would have. And you heard Ricky Bo say they're not really that close in that conversation. So that is a big issue. I, I just look at Reese Hoskins and I go, while I like what he brings to the table when he's playing hot baseball, when he's playing his good version of baseball, you know, okay, this is going to be a difference maker, right? Like, this is a guy who can step into that lineup and just crush the baseball at will when he's on his game. He seems to go through extreme highs and extreme lows, sort of like Bryce Harper, but his highs are so high, they're valuable. With our starting pitching spots right now, though, Jake Arrieta coming off the books, would I be opposed to trading Reese Hoskins when he has a bit of value? I wouldn't be opposed to it. It would depend on what you get in return, but I would not be opposed to it. It just needs to be, you know, maybe a starting pitcher that I value and that I would like seeing this rotation behind an Aaron Nola, Zach Wheeler. So then it could be Nola, Wheeler, enter someone there, Zach Eflin. Although, you know me, I'm not big on Aaron Nola being your number one guy. I want him to be the two guy because then if you get someone ahead of him, then it's somebody in front of him, Aaron Nola, Zach Wheeler, Eflin. That is way stronger. But, you know, that option isn't really um, just available at the moment and, it's not like the, the Phillies have a Sixto Sanchez in their organization or have an opportunity to to call somebody up like that. <laughs> kind of funny, huh? Oh, it's painful. My last thing on JT. I, I'm not I'm not happy with the way the organization has handled this by any means. I don't trust them to make the proper decisions. If he does walk and Arietta coming off the books, like there's money to go around. If they fix a lot of these holes with that money, 
and they go out and get a serviceable average starting catcher, they fix the bullpen help, they add things to the to the roster as a whole, if they use that money and actually help build this team in another way, I can support it. Now, I don't trust them to do that. Matt Klintak being in place, that doesn't make me feel confident at all. But I can at least support that logic. It's bad optics right now with JT, and, and I, I wouldn't be mad if he's here. I'm just saying the other side is if they don't sign him, Arietta's off the books. If they go out and, and say they go spend some money to help these pieces and to help this team, the problem is you have Bryce Harper, who's your superstar guy, being so vocal about wanting JT here, and now you're starting to piss him off. Although, you know, I, I've been pretty consistent with this. You, you can't make decisions based off of Bryce Harper. I know it's hard not to. I know it's easy to get sucked into his voice and what he puts on Instagram and things of that nature. But as an organization, you got to do what you feel is right. Once again, though, that's me not trusting who's in charge to make those decisions. And that's where um, it, it's a problem. So once again, thank you so much to Ricky Bo. I hope you enjoyed this. I know I did. It was it was fun to hear him speak. He's, we watch him all the time, fired up, pre and post game. And uh, now we got a little bit of that on Sports Talk with Broad. So thank you all so much for listening, and I will see you next time.